Awesome. Joining us now on the show, our favorite uncle, everyone's favorite uncle, Blaine Fowler, dual threat analyst, college basketball, <laughs> color commentator. Yes, and one of the original Coog dudes. I, I want to be Coog dude's uncle. <laughs> Can I be his uncle too? When we say Uncle B, we mean Uncle for BYU Sports Nation. Like yeah. Okay. The then he, then he is my nephew. Yes. Yeah. I mean, not like you guys because you guys really are blood. Yeah, right. But <laughs> but I want to adopt him. What Studio I, B blood? I, I want to adopt Blood's him blood. in. I want to adopt him in because that's. I mean, I really respect him for the fashion risks that he took in that well, game. Wow. And I, and I love it. BYU's at San Francisco. You're a Don fan. You walk in. Like, can you imagine walking in the Marriott Center? There's some dude dressed as a Don. I, I'd no. be like, I have respect for you. <laughs> Absolute <laughs> respect for the fashion risk. Well, Coop, dude. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And would BYU ben, would Ben that. Nichols wear that on the hill in Salt Lake City, though? For his safety, I don't know that he would. Well, safety first, especially <laughs> in that arena, right? Am I right or am I right? Ned Ryerson? Oh. Okay. Right or am I right? Am I right? <laughs> All right. I never can have too much insurance. Am I right or am I right? <laughs> yes. We've been talking about Yoli Childs, Blaine. Uh, our Twitter question today, and what a performance, 23 points, 17 rebounds. What do you want to see from Yoli Childs the rest of the season? Now that we've seen kind of a peak moment for him, what he's capable of at his peak. It, you know, I wanted to see him just continue to do what he's doing. So, so I think from a matchup perspective, he got good looks, and he's unbelievably capable. And so I don't know that he has to score like that every week, but when he has opportunities, I want to see him score like that. I want to sh see him shoot a high percentage. I want to see him double-digit rebound, and I want to see shot selection out of him that's good shot selection. So I don't want him to force trying to get to 20-plus every game. I want him to get 20 when he's got a good matchup. And, but on the, on the other side of that, I, I want when somebody else has a good matchup for them to get 23, and I want to see consistent guard play every single solitary night. And I think that, that will make the difference for BYU down, you know, this this home stretch and into next season. But but from him, I don't want to see him four shots now that he just got 20-something. But, but he's capable of doing that night in and night out. The juxtaposition of the two games BYU played last week for a lot of BYU fans is kind of mind-boggling. Pepperdine shoots essentially 60% for the game. They score a season-high 99 points. They crush BYU's spirit, right? Then the Cougars turn around and go to San Francisco. Pretty good team that had won, uh, I think, like eight games in a row. And eight out of nine. Eight out of nine. Yeah. And they win by 16 in the Bay Area and hold San Francisco to a really low shooting percentage. So what? where do you see all this? How can you explain <laughs> what happened last week? It's consistency defensively. Have we been talking about this all year? Consistently, we've discussed yeah, this. And so, so you, you're not going to shoot the ball great every night. You know, Gonzaga doesn't shoot the ball great every night. They're, they're more consistent with, than BYU is, so they don't have the ups and downs. They don't have the swings, but they have, they have small swings. And what Gonzaga does is, is when they're not shooting it well, their defensive effort rises to the occasion. And it just seems like when you look at the stats week in and week out, game in and game out, they're out shooting their opponent. They're like – Wow, they didn't shoot it that well. They only shot 44%, but they held St. Mary's to 34% or, or whatever it is. Whatever they shoot, they go out and they have a defensive effort that holds their opponent below their shooting percentage, and then they win. And for BYU, when they have these off nights, um, it seems to compound itself when they're not playing good defensively that they go down and they feel like they got to get it all back on one trip down the court and they force bad shots. And so their shooting percentage is even worse. So, so it plays on itself. And when BYU is good defensively, so the Gonzaga game here, even though they lost that game, they were there on the catch. So they knew who the shooters were. And when those shooters were coming off screens or it was coming inside out, they were there on the shooter when they caught the basketball. So from the time that shooter has the ball in his hands, they're feeling uncomfortable. They're guarded. When, when teams are going off, BYU is helping, and then they're rallying out, and a guy's catching the ball, and he's comfortable, and now somebody's closing out, and he's got a hand in their face. But, but it's not the same as being there on the catch. And so against St. Mary's, that's what you have to do. Did you guys get a chance to watch Gonzaga and St. Mary's? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So they let Landau kind of – he had got his, and they forced him to play defense. He had four fouls in the game, but he got his points. But nobody else hurt the Zags because Emmett Nar it didn't matter who it was. When they caught the basketball, there was a Gonzaga defender in their face. So they made it miserable for everybody else. And then, uh, and, and then they played their normal efficient offensive game. But I, I didn't think the Zags were as good offensively as they have been at, at times this year against St. Mary's. St. Mary's is a really good defensive team. 
But Gonzaga raised their level, and every time one of those guys on the perimeter caught the basketball, there was somebody in their face. It was really uncomfortable for St. Mary's, who likes to be in rhythm in their offense and is really efficient. Gonzaga made them not as efficient. It was just tougher on them. That's what BYU has to do night in and night out defensively, especially against these two teams. San Diego is going to depend on knocking down shots. So when Murray catches the ball, be in his face the second he catches it. When he comes off of a screen, put your nose on the back of his number and follow him across the top of the screen and be there so he never feels comfortable. And, and you, maybe you can't help as much inside, but BYU's bigs can defend inside. They don't need to double every time in there. Uh, Gonzaga has been making the season miserable for everybody. I just want to, <laughs> ma- I just want to make that. They make everybody okay. uncomfortable, right? Yeah, everyone's uncomfortable. Everyone's miserable in the WCC right now. Um, did BYU play really good defense, or did UCF just shoot terribly? Can't because, believe how bad they the, shot. The, the Don shot twenty five percent from the field, seventy three shots, twenty one more than BYU. They took forty three threes, made twelve. Yeah, it it was a combination and. And the longer the game went on, the more, you know, if you're not shooting it well early, and San Francisco's a rhythm offense, the way, the way they run it. Um, there's some Princeton principles to what they do, but much faster pace than you would see in Princeton. And they're not afraid to get down and shoot it in transition. So early on, BYU came out with a mindset they were going to defend. They were there on the catch. They caused them some problems, so they weren't comfortable. And then, and then San Francisco, when they finally, when you, when you defend really well early, then sometimes if, if you've taken six shots and it feels like somebody's been in your face every time, then on the seventh shot, you're wide open. You rush because you can't believe you're open. It's like, oh, my gosh, I'm open. i got to shoot it. And you rush it, and then you, you come up short or you shoot the ball long. And so I think early good defense um, and the pressure of being there on the catch and doing those kinds of things forced San Francisco to miss some open shots. So th- it's a combination of both, but credit BYU's defense for making them miss open shots too because they were really good and their effort level was good in that. S- more similar to the Gonzaga game than to the Pepperdine game, let's say. Okay, so just to recap, you feel like comparing last week's two games, BYU on Saturday against San Francisco did a better job of being there in the defender's face when the ball arrived compared to Pepperdine when they were chasing too much. Right. And and I do think that on the offensive side of it, um, they were they had better shot selection. And that that's to me, that's how BYU's offense goes. It's do they play with the effort defensively? And then how is their shot selection offensively? And I think defense leads to offense. When they're playing good defense, they get more transition buckets. They don't feel like they're chasing um, offensively and have to, I gotta make a three this time down the court because we're and then they dribble into a three. This team takes a lot of bad shots, and that's – you know, BYU's putting a young team. We keep saying it, but it is a young team. You know, look at the Gonzaga team. They've got a lot of veteran guys out there, and, and Nigel does an unbelievable job of saying, hey, guys, this is – you know, they, they, they have calming influences out on the court that have been there and done that, and they don't take bad shots. They just don't. And, and so BYU compounds – sometimes a lack of defensive effort, would try to make up for it on the offensive end, and they force shots. So those are the two things. Good shot selection, make the extra pass, don't force up a shot, and play with unbelievable effort and be there on the catch on some of these good shooters. You have to know who the good shooters are. Some guys you can rally to and just close under control. Other guys you better be there on the catch. You have to do your scouting report and know who those guys are, and the good shooters, you, like like Murray, you better be there on the catch when he when when he catches. Yeah. And they didn't do that against them, right? Absolutely. And and so you have to know your scouting report has to be good. Nar, you better be there on the catch when he catches the ball. And so they have to know who those guys are and who they can help off of and get back to and be sound with their scouting report. Final two regular season home games for BYU, barring uh, you know some NIT hosting or something. Uh, this is it for BYU at home. BYU uh, plays San Diego, who uh, beat BYU by seven. That means BYU win by 17 or 30 or something. <laughs> it's home, right? <laughs> and then, it's home. And then St. Mary's uh, Saturday night. Both late tips, by the way. Eight, uh, nine o'clock local time Thursday, and then uh, eight on Saturday. What do you think of the two matchups this week? Yeah, I, I think these are these are kind of must wins. They need a big win to give them confidence going into the tournament. If they're if they're going to get to the tournament finals, I, you know, we keep saying this. Can BYU beat Gonzaga in the finals? What I mean, what's the percentage chance? Like four percent. Yeah, but on a neutral floor. But hey, if, seriously, if you don't get to the final, you've got zero chance. And it's one game. I just want right. to see, right? And you would have to go. Yeah, through Yeah, so, so on they, they got it. And their mindset has to be whether we're going to be in the NCAA tournament because they win the WCC tournament or they get to the NIT. Um, they need to take momentum into postseason, and and you do that by getting to the championship game, and and proving that hey, it, we're a top two team again in this league. I think that starts with a game that I just expect if they don't win against San Diego at home, then that's just messed up. Okay. But, and, and then 
They need to get a confidence-boosting win, and St. Mary's at home. Can they beat St. Mary's at home? I believe that they can beat St. Mary's at home. St. Mary's, you know, we said, can they beat Gonzaga at home? And we were like, uh, I, I don't know. They'd have to play. When everybody you, will have to play well, and everybody didn't play well. When your voice goes really high, that's yeah, this is not good. <laughs> but the, I mean, they, but they can beat St. Mary's by at home. twelve at St. Mary's. They're capable of beating St. Mary's yes. in Provo. Oh, and, and the crowd's going to be there. It's going to be a fun night. St. Mary's is a big time rhythm offense. You got to get them out of their rhythm, get them off of their spots. And you know what? It's okay with me if Landau has 20 and 10. You just can't let the other guys go. Nar and Rayhan and Hermanson. Yeah. And, and and so you look at look at Nar, Rayhan, Hermanson, all those guys against Gonzaga. Gonzaga was in their face and 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 Landau played well. He was one of the best players on the floor. That's okay. He can play well. Make him defend like crazy down low and then make him earn his points but don't let anybody else go off and that's a lot more likely to happen at home than it is on the road because those guys are really comfortable shooting the ball in their in their building in, in Moraga. How about this Blaine which underclassman not named Eric Mika and you've got quite a few to choose from on this BYU team is the most important to BYU basketball's future success? Well, I, I think the guards have to play with consistency but I just think it's the guards as a group but but Yoli Childs, to me, and we talked about him at the beginning, has the potential to be great. I mean great. And I, and I was talking to Ben, our producer, before I came on. And I'm going to say this, and then there's going to be people on Twitter that are going, was he out of his mind? His athletic skill set reminds me of Kawhi Leonard when he was a freshman. Wow. Hmm. And, and I remember the, the, the word on Kawhi was, and remember, I've known Kawhi since he was 18 years old. I interviewed him before he came to San Diego State and got to know him. And, and – they're very similar paths. So Kawhi was a guy that San Diego State got into as a sophomore in high school, like BYU got into Yoli in terms of recruiting, right? And so you look at their numbers as freshmen, and people are going, I know people at home right now are going, Yoli is no Kawhi Leonard. Well, guess what? Kawhi wasn't Kawhi when he was an 18 and 19-year-old, right? He wasn't who he is. And the questions we had about Kawhi was, ooh, is he going to increase his range? Can he get outside and shoot more? Yes. He's unbelievable inside, and he's a great rebounder, and he's so bouncy. Um, but what's his range going to be like? Can he improve his range? He's a, he's a really good defender. Now, one thing that San Diego State did, they, that year when he was a freshman and his sophomore year, they had, they had Billy White inside with him, and they also had Malcolm Thomas inside. I mean, remember, those teams were really They're good. Fantastic. Yeah, that was when Jimmer was here. So he had, he had a lot of good interior defenders along with him. So they played him at the three a lot more, and he could just go out and shut down a three. Yoli has potential to be able to play that position too. He's going to need to really, really work to get his lateral quickness, but he has the body to do it. Of all BYU's players, he has the most NBA-like body and the NBA-like skill set. He's got to more come, than Eric Mika. He's got and Eric's long, but Eric's got to get way stronger. Er, Eric is a, has an NBA skill set too because of his length and he's a bouncy 6'10 guy that can run up and down the floor too so, so both of those guys have a really really good shot but both of them have to go from here to here and nobody talks about Yoli and, and Eric is so polished but Eric's a return missionary sophomore Yoli's a brand new freshman and and Kawhi Leonard didn't develop his three-point game until he was in the NBA yeah how about that? shoot those in college and his in his mid-range game was better his sophomore year than his freshman year, and and I look at Yoli, and I'm and I'm saying he's not Kawhi Leonard. Like, I'm not saying he's going to be as good as Kawhi Leonard, the best player in the NBA, arguably. You know, he's the MVP of the finals, um, one of the best players in the NBA. But what I'm saying is, as a freshman, he looks a lot like him. And when Kawhi was a sophomore in high school, Steve Fisher got into him in recruiting. And then by the time he was a senior, he kind of blew up, and everybody was there. Then everybody wanted him, but he was loyal to Steve Fisher and San Diego State and went there and played. Yoli is a sophomore, BYU got on him, he was a local kid. And then by the time Yoli was a senior, everybody, you know, Auburn, you name it, wanted Yoli. Auburn, Arizona and he, State, and Cal, he was, yeah. And he was loyal to Dave Rose and BYU. I mean, their stories are really, really similar. And um, Yoli has a potential to be really, really good. And Kawhi as a sophomore was a 15 and 10 guy. When we looked as a freshman, he was a 13 and nine guy. So. I, I, I don't think that that's a stretch to say athletically they're similar. Now, and Kawhi was kind of a quiet guy like Yoli is, willing to defer to the upperclassmen and, and do those kinds of things, and then, then he developed as a go-to guy. He's never been a demonstrative, yeah, loud guy. Painfully shy. Yeah, and so it, it, the, the parallels are really eerie, and now I know how hard Kawhi works and has worked over his career. If Yoli's willing to put in that kind of work, I don't know where it goes. But as a as an 18 year old and a 19 year old, 
there's there's a lot of similarities. So I think he has the potential to be great. Yeah. And it depends on how much work he puts in. Well, and the one constant that we have already talked about today is that Yoli Childs has the work ethic. Everything I've ever heard about him. And, and, and I and I, I've heard the stories from Steve Fisher about the recruiting of Kawhi. And I, and I don't know if we've told this, but Dave Rose told me, he goes, man, I love Yoli. That, that type of recruit that's that high level, when, when he comes in, the last question they always ask in their interview with Coach Rose is, so what's, what's my playing time look like and what, you know, where's, what's my role on this team? And Dave says he's always waiting for that. I don't think that Dave would care that I share this. And so they get on his on-campus visit to the end of the visit with, with Dave, and, and Yoli says to Dave, so Eric Mika, and he starts going through the big three, and, and you got Eli, these guys, all of these guys, they're all coming back, right? And Dave's like, oh, here we go. Here's the, how do I fit in? What's my role going to be? How am I going to be a star? And Dave goes, yes, they're all committed to come back. And Yoli goes, oh, awesome, because those are the guys I want to play with. And so Dave's like, the kid has no <laughs> ego. Bingo. And that's the kind of guy that will put the work in to expand that. You know, he's got, got a lot of God-given talent to expand that. He's, so he's got potential to be a great player. Uncle B, bringing it in studio, B. Thanks for the time, Blaine. You bet, guys.